This war is not about economics for the Russians. From their point of view, if they can't reestablish the forward crustal defense that the Soviet Union had, they will disappear from this earth. And they're right. Their demographics are terminal. This, this was always going to be the last century of the Russian ethnicity. And they feel, and I think rightly, that if they can't forward position, then they're going to be fighting internal rebellions at home because probably now one in three Russian citizens is no longer ethnically Russian. And the non-Russian ethnics have very high birth rates, while the Russian ethics have very low birth rates. So they really do see this as the twilight of their lives and the right. So if we get to a position where the Russians feel that the leverage makes sense, of course they'll do it. But from the European point of view, they're not going to force the issue as a unit, as a European Union. There's still the possibility that some country like in Italy or Latvia will just decide, you know, enough is enough and start going after the maritime cargo. And that'll destroy the insurance picture for the entire region. And that is more than enough to type this into crisis in multiple sectors all at once. Bottom line here, the Russian stuff will all go away and never come back. That's cooked in now. Uh, the Russian technological base is weak. Their workforce is, was hollowed out before they started throwing hundreds of thousands of people at this conflict. They're un incapable of maintaining their own system, especially when it comes to energy and petrochemicals and mining. A lot of the growth we have seen around the world since 1992 has been about the inclusion of places that didn't participate in the first wave of globalization into the system. That's Brazil, that's China, that's Russia. If you go back to 1992, there was only one product where Russia was a top three producer, and that was oil. Now they're a top three producer of over 20 different materials that we all use every day. Without the Russians participating eagerly, this will all go away. The question is whether it's this month, this year, this decade. So we all need to prepare for that one way or another. So there's just a lot of things we're going to have to figure out how to do differently or how to do regionally if we still want the things we've become used to. So the, Russia has 8 million men in their 20s. About a million are now committed to the war. About another million have left. If Putin is not in power, someone very much like him will be. There was a coup in the Soviet period back in 1982. And at that point, the, the KGB took over. And that was Chernomirdin and Adropov and Gorbachev. Putin is the heir to that legacy, which is another way of saying that the only people who are in the political elite in Russia are former KGB officers who trained during the Soviet period. Well, that means they're all in their late 50s or older, and there's only about 130 of them. And they all see the world the same way, and Putin has been able to purge that group over the last 22 years in order to make sure that there are no challengers to the throne. So as long as it's someone from that elite who's in charge, Putin's fine. Uh, the only way we should expect a political shift is in Russia is if the military defeat is so catastrophic that you get a revolution. That is traditionally how you see political change in uh, the, the former Soviet world. And we're just not there yet. There's, there's two weak spots here. The first one is on the input side, specifically raw material. So the Russian, Russians have one mine that produces 40% of global palladium. There's palladium in every semiconductor. And there is a two-country supply chain system to produce neon, which is used to focus the apertures of the etching lasers. And for that, the first stage is in Russia, and the second stage was in Ukraine and Mariupol. And that's now gone. So that's conservatively half of global neon is gone. So we know we're going to face a semiconductor crunch when we just can't produce the volume we've become used to until we replace those sources from somewhere else. Uh, if there was cheap palladium laying around, we would have done that already. And neon, that's a two to three year period to build out the physical infrastructure to make it happen. The Koreans have started, the Chinese have started, but it's a race against time. So that's problem one. Problem two is that there's not just one kind of semiconductor, so it gets kind of hairy really quickly. But let's start on the high end, because that's what everybody is concerned about. There are over 6,000 firms globally that are involved in semiconductor fab facilities for the 10 nanometer and better chips. 5,000 of them are involved with a company called ASML, which is a Dutch firm that does the lithography. Most of those 5,000 firms have no global competition. They're highly specialized. They do one thing for ASML, and most of them only have ASML as a customer. Now, these firms exist in China and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, the United States and Canada, Mexico, and above all, Germany. You miss a few of those pieces, and ASML in its current form cannot function. Now, I am a 
huge fan of ASNL. I think it is the world's best company, it, it, when it, whether it's quality control, managing their supply chain, the technical innovation, the corporate secrecy. Oh my God, they're so good at that. But they are the only company on the planet that makes the lithographing machines, which are the most sophisticated machines humans build, for every single one of the fabs that produces the 10 nanometer and better chips. So one piece of that constellation falls out and the whole thing stops. So we don't need a war over Taiwan for this to break down. We need to rebuild the ecosystem in a more sustainable way. And since there are so many pieces to that, this is a multi-year process. So we should count on losing the leading edge chips on a global basis. On the low end, 90 nanometer and worse, the analog chips, the Internet of Things chips, that is 70, 80% within the Chinese system. We should count on losing those too. Now, everything in the middle, the 90 to the 10, like the workhorse chips, most of what we need to do the things that we consider necessary, whether it's aerospace, computers that are not servers, that system is more redundant. That system has more players that uh, are have more backup and there's more competition across the space. I actually think that general area will be fine. But if you want to do Internet of Things, if you want to do electric vehicles, if you want to do automated driving or AI, that we need to write off for a few years. And that is going to be very difficult to build back at scale. But in the worst case scenario, and I don't get to say good news very often, so take this, please take this to heart. Most of the functionality that we have now in our vehicles, in our automation systems, in our aerospace, in our computing, most of that is not as good as the 10 nanometer chips. So some of the newer phones are 10 nanometer or better, but most of them are 10 nanometer or worse. So we might have to take a bit of a breather, but most of what we have now will continue to work. It's just that the pace of improvement is going to slow considerably. It's not just that 90% of the good chips are made in in Taiwan. It's that the constellation of forces that allow them to be made in the first place, that is what's in danger. It doesn't matter where the break is. ASML is too d distributed in the production system and they have no backups internally and there is no backup in the market. 10 nanometer chips and better are the ultimate distillation and physical manifestation of a perfect globalized environment that has held for decades because it has taken decades for each and every one of these companies to get as good as they are at what they do. I don't think the environment that gave us globalization for these last 50 years, 70 years is redoable. We don't have the population structure on a global basis to make it work anyway. Everybody's kind of aged out and you can't have global trade without global consumption. And now the demographics of Italy and Germany and Russia and China and Korea, are, they're all terminal. The, the basis has never been there. We were always going to get here. We just now have political military issues that are kind of bringing our use by day forward. This was always going to be the decade that this all broke. The Russians and to a lesser degree, the Chinese are taking steps to make that happen faster.